in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, boys and girls. Welcome to the Islamic Information and Dawah Center's free monthly lecture series entitled Islam and Other Religions. Tonight's topic, what does it mean to be human? For more information about the Islamic Dawah and Information Center, Information and Dawah Center, Please, guests, and, uh, and about our events and further events, please go to Islamic Information, IslamInfo.com. My name is Sasha Purse, and it is my honor and my pleasure to be your MC and moderator for tonight. So, how is everybody tonight? Are you guys awake? Is this, is this thing on? How is everybody tonight? One more time. How is everybody tonight? All right, all right. Alhamdulillah. I would like to extend a very warm welcome for everybody coming out, for those tuning in via our internet broadcast. We appreciate you taking your time and your busy schedule to join us for tonight's event. Tonight I ask everybody to please listen to the speaker sincerely with an unbiased, unbiased mind, open ears, and heart. Also, please save any remarks and any questions for the question and answer service and write them down. Right now, everyone's probably asking themselves, well, how are the questions going to be asked? Well, how is this going to follow through? Well, you know, if you guys will put your hands up as things are going by, as we go and the speakers are speaking, um, you'll have, we'll have some volunteers go around uh, with black shirts with some green writings. They'll say volunteer on them. They'll, be have, they'll have a pink bucket and they'll be handing out uh, some paper and some pen um, so you guys can write them down. They'll come around a little bit later and you can feel free, throw them in the, in the bucket. They'll be brought up. We'll uh, ask them uh, at that time. So now for a quick rundown of tonight's event. Each, speech, each speaker will begin with, with 20 minutes of their opening statement followed by responses after that, further responses. Then we'll have a break at 7.35 till about 8.10 for our Makhrib prayer or our first evening prayer. And that'll be a chance for everyone to get some refreshments, take a quick break. If we have any questions, we can write them down, think them through at that time. Um, and at that time, at about 7.37, so two minutes after we break, we'll hear the call for prayer, the Adhan, as it's pronounced in Arabic. And we will resume at about 8.10. So that'll give us about the prayers for the brothers. That'll give us about 20 minutes. For everyone else, it's closer to about half an hour for break, refreshments. And we'll, we'll re reveen and re restart with our Q&A session. That'll be about 35 to 45 minutes. And then to sum up the event, we'll have the closing statements by our speakers for a final five minutes. Tonight, we're honored to have Reverend Steve Martins. He is the staff apologetic and junior apologetic in residence, residence at Ezra Institute of Contemporary, Christi of Contemporary Christianity, and he is currently pursuing his master's in apologetics at Veritas Evangelical Seminary. Can I get a warm welcome, please? And we have Dr. Shabir Ali with his PhD in Quranic Interpretations, his Master's in Comparative Religions, who has been blessed to travel many countries talking about his passion, God, Islam, Comparative Religion. And he appears as the resident, speak as the resident speaker weekly on a TV program, Let the Quran Speak, and any past episodes can be viewed on www.quranspeaks.com. So for both of our speakers, can I get a warm welcome, please? So we'll begin tonight's event. Um, it has been decided that Reverend, Mar that Reverend Steve Martins will go first with his opening statements. Reverend Stephen? Good evening, everyone. I think this is working. I did want to say a quick uh, greeting and uh, thank you, uh, thank the Islamic Information and Dawah Center for uh, having us and putting this event together. I want to thank Dr. Shabir 
um, who I have known for the past, I believe, two to three years. Um, he has become a friend of mine, uh, which I appreciate. I've actually followed him through the years, I've watched many of his videos. And so to be able to be in a dialogue in participation with him is uh, quite a privilege, which I, I, I greatly uh, acknowledge. Uh, and I, even though we uh, disagree clearly on theological matters, given that I'm a Christian and that Shabir is a Muslim, uh, we are still able to call each other friends, and for that I'm also very thankful for. Well, with that, I will start my time right now. What does it mean to be human? It's a relevant question to ask during the Easter weekend for the church. Is man the result of blind causality as believed by secular humanists? Is he the creation of a sovereign God? Is he created in God's image or is he foreign in likeness to his creator? Well, what we believe about man, his origin, nature, and being will determine what we believe about morality, meaning, and destiny. It's apparent to all, regardless of what worldview one possesses, that man struggles with his human condition. The secular humanist Justin Trottier admitted to this in his previous dialogue, that man does struggle with his human condition. Muslims also agree that there is something wrong with humanity, given that we continue to read of wars, crimes, killings, and more. In fact, the human condition is painted throughout human history with blood. Well, how do we then make sense of humanity? How do we make sense of our human condition and what solution is there? Well, my understanding, understanding is Islam appears to recognize the problem of sin, as we find recorded in the hadiths in which Muhammad prays, O Allah, wash away my sins with the water of snow and hail, and cleanse my heart from all the sins as a white garment is cleansed from the filth, and let there be a long distance between me and my sins as you made east and west far from each other. It's apparent that Muhammad borrowed from Psalm 51, verse 2, verse 7, chapter 103, verse 12, and Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, for his prayer or other biblical texts. However, whether or not they were readily available to him in, in textual form or passed on orally, they were removed from the redemptive context of the biblical text. Now, such borrowing of texts is generally excused by Islamic scholars Hamza, Rizvi, and Mayer, who write that the Abrahamic traditions are acknowledged by all Muslims as sister religions whose geo-historical and spiritual continuity with Islam is obvious. This is why Islam also believes that man is the creation of God, as we find in Surah 15, Ayah 26, and we indeed created man from dried clay made of molded mud. Now, similar to what we find in the biblical book of Genesis, the Quran states that Adam dwelt with his wife in the garden and was told that he could eat of anything in the garden except the fruit from a particular tree. Now, according to the Quran, Surah 2, Ayah 36, then Satan made them stumble therefrom and expelled them from that wherein they were. Well, how does Allah respond to their sin, their violation of God's command? Well, he showed them mercy, as we see in Surah 2, Ayah 37. But the Quran makes no mention of the penalty of sin, nor of a promised savior, as we find, for example, in the book of Genesis. For the Quran, to make a claim of correspondence and continuity with the earlier scriptures, which are the Torah, the Torah, the Injil, Gospel, and the Zubur, the Zabur, Psalms, in which Surah 3, Ayah 3 states, he sent down the book upon thee in truth, confirming what was before it, and he sent down the Torah and the Gospel. There are significant differences between the Bible and the Quran that make them irreconcilable to each other. Now let us consider three things as we discuss the question, what does it mean to be human? Firstly, the Quran's retelling of man's origin is foreign to that of Genesis and that human beings created in the image of God is not a concept found in the Quran. Now, in dismissing man's likeness to the God of Islam, the God of Muhammad essentially becomes unknowable to humanity. Islam holds to the doctrine of Tawi, the oneness of God. But this God is essentially described as a singularity in which commentator Fadl Allah writes, the mental faculty cannot reach him in his elusive and hidden mystery. Allah is essentially unintelligible to the human mind, inapproachable, given that there exists no possible likeness between man and God, and hence he remains unknowable in his isolated oneness. We should then ask ourselves how the Quran should be understood if it's the revelation of law, given that no human language is adequate enough to communicate information from an isolated singularity that is entirely other from the created world. In essence, if we cannot know God, then we cannot know anything about his creation, because God is so other that he is unintelligible, and therefore the Quran fails to make sense of what man is. Man, for example, is a relational being. 
However, the same cannot be said for God because he is a singularity within Islamic theology. Before space and time, there was no one whom he could be relational with in order to be a relational being. Now, like all forms of religious humanism, it emphasizes an unknowable divinity concept with a God that cannot be known relationally. This implies that man is essentially no different than any other life form in creation, as there is no foundation or base upon which man can distinguish his being and worth from other entities. He cannot make sense of who he is because he bears absolutely no resemblance to his creator, and therefore he cannot determine based on his creator because he has no relation to the creator. He cannot determine his worth based on his creator. Well, if man then is not created in God's image, then what is he? Secondly, the Quran does not define what the sin of man is. Instead, it reads that Adam and Eve were led astray by Satan, which is assumed to mean that they were tempted to eat of the forbidden tree. But in comparison to the biblical text, the Quran fails to make sense of the grave seriousness of sin and its affront to God. You see, no penalty is paid for the sin of Adam. No repercussions follow the disobedience of God's command. It is forgiven as implied by the ascribed title, the merciful to God, but it's more tantamount to sweeping it under the rug or almost turning a blind eye to it. Now, yes, Adam forfeited the garden. We can grasp that from Quranic literature. But his disobedience was not severe enough to require the forfeiture of life, as we read, for example, in Genesis. Now, yes, we see in Surah 7, Ayah 25, that man shall live and die. But this is not understood as a payment or a repercussion for Adam and Eve's sin. However, in Genesis, an, anim an animal is slain to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve, and they are instructed on offering sacrifices for, to cover their sin for their atonement. Now, in essence, the holiness of God, as revealed in the Hebrew Bible, is not the same holiness of Allah in the Quran. In fact, we find that the righteousness of God is not taken as seriously in the Quran as it is in the Bible. Thirdly, the Quran teaches that man does not inherit a sin nature. As Surah 30, Ayah 30 implies, instead man is created upright and is born righteous. However, the human condition that we all struggle with is explained as man's imperfection, in which Surah 4, Ayah 28 states, for man was created weak. Well, why would Allah create man weak? From the outset of his creation, man was made vulnerable to corruption. He is subject to temptation, to being enticed, to being misled, to being forgetful of the goodness of God. Whereas the biblical narrative explains these human traits as the consequence of man's sin, the Quran implies that man was always created this way. This is why we read in Surah 14, Ayah 34, that truly mankind is wrongdoing ungrateful which also explains why Muslims have a hard time believing in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, as we find in the Gospels. Well, in this human condition, what Islam offers mankind is the religion of Islam to rectify his ways, to submit to Allah. And if we understand the pillars of Islam appropriately, those being the shahada or the creed, the prayer, almsgiving, fasting, and the pilgrimage, man can attain salvation and righteousness by his own works. Essentially, Islam is uh, just another form of religious humanism in which, similar to all other world religions, man is the center of its worldview. He can author his own salvation. He can build his own Islamic utopia on earth. He can deliver himself from his own evils by means of what Allah has provided. Now, if the Quran is supposedly the revelation of God, you would expect to find a redemptive continuity with the Torah and the Gospels, the earlier scriptures. But instead, you find a very different salvation path consisting of works and good deeds. Therefore, receiving salvation as a reward or righteousness as a reward as opposed to a gift of God's grace. But as I had implied, salvation from what? The fall of mankind is nowhere clear in the Quran. In fact, it fails to make sense of man's sin, and it fails to correspond with mankind's sin nature because it essentially fails to make sense of what man is. Well, how then does Christianity differ? Contrary to Quranic literature, the Bible does make clear that man was created in the image of God. And thus man can be considered the crown of all creation and that human beings are connected with God in a profoundly significant way. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 states that God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. This is why murder, for example, is wrong because it is not only a violation of God's moral law, thou shalt not kill, but it is also an assault upon the image of God. You see, the worth of man, then, the value of human dignity, is determined by the one whose image we bear. God is intelligible to us because we are created in his image. We are relational beings because we are created by a relational being. We are rational beings because we are created by a rational being who is one and three persons. 
We are then able to have a relationship with God because he is intelligible to the human mind, and in bearing his likeness, we can be relational with God. Now, as opposed to being created as weak human beings with perhaps an inclination to sin, both Adam and Eve were created good because all that they knew was the goodness and righteousness of God. The sin, however, that was committed by both Adam and Eve is found recorded in Genesis, in which their temptation was to be like God, becoming morally independent from God, epistemologically independent from their creator, and deciding for themselves what is just and unjust, good and evil. They sought to be their own gods. And it was in disobeying God's command that they gained the knowledge of good and evil by the experience of their own rebellion and disobedience. Now, because Adam was the chief head over all humanity, their disobedience meant the rest of humanity would be cursed with a sin nature, total depravity. What is a sin nature? It's a lack of conformity, active or passive, to the moral law of God consisting of an inner disposition to violate God's morally perfect standards. We find support for this in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, which reads, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, referring to the worship of idols, visiting the iniquity or sins of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Psalm 51, verse 5, not only affirms this, but contradicts the Quran's teaching that man is born upright, which reads, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. The theologian Charles Spurgeon comments on this passage, stating that infants are no innocents. Being born with original sin, all are sinners, infected with the guilt and filth of sin. The wrath overrunneth the whole flock. Well, what do we read as to the penalty of sin in the Bible? Romans chapter 6, verse 23 reads, For the wages of sin is death. And Genesis chapter 1, verse 17 records that God telling Adam that his disobedience would result in death. But when Adam and Eve sinned, God performed the first sacrifice to cover their nakedness, a sacrifice for their sin, for the atonement of their sin. And it is here that death entered the garden and the world, but also where we see the grace of God. We see this practice of sacrifice carried on through Cain and Abel, with Abel's sacrifice being accepted by God because it was a blood sacrifice, not a vegetable sacrifice that Cain was offering. Noah also offered sacrifices for the sins of his family, which is evident given that he took on more ceremonially clean animals on the ark to last him a little bit over a year until the waters recited. Abraham sacrificed a ram in place of his son to foreshadow that God will provide the means for mankind's forgiveness. The Passover in Egypt, with the doorpost being marked with lamb's blood, was another sacrifice that foreshadowed the forgiveness of sin once and for all to come. Throughout the biblical text, we, th- we find that with every covenant God establishes with man, sacrifice is required because of the holiness, righteousness, and authority of God. Consider that when the law of God was given in the Pentateuch, it was given along with the tabernacle specifications. Now, why is that? Because where the law was provided, there had to be sacrifice for the atonement of sin, the violation of the law, because man in his sin nature cannot keep the law. It not only showed them the holy righteousness of God, the character of God, but it restrained man from continuing further in his sin. Now again, contrary to Quranic literature, the historical fall of mankind in Genesis records the first messianic prophecy in Genesis 3, verse 15, of one whom uh, would directly address the problem of sin, which reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, referring to Eve, and between your seed and her seed, And he, referring to Christ, shall bruise you on the head, referring to the triumph through the crucifixion and resurrection. And you, referring to to Satan, shall bruise him on the heel, referring to the suffering on the cross. Now this is demonstrably fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20 and Galatians chapter 4 verse 4. The Messiah, Jesus, being born of the woman's seed. His virgin birth is prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1 verses 22 to 23, and Luke chapter 1 verse 26 to 31, which by claiming continuity, the Quran agrees with as well, despite borrowing from the apocryphal infancy gospels of Thomas and James. But the central piece of this first messianic prophecy is concerning the payment of our sin debt through a sacrificial death on the cross. Since the violation of the law requires death as its penalty, It was the death of the Christ, the Son of God, who fulfilled the law, who satisfied God's perfect justice. This is the fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrificial system, which prophetically symbolized and foreshadowed the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. 
We read of the atonement sacrifice in Exodus chapter 29, verse 38 to 39 and 42, which states that this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old day by day regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And it should be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 10 reads, If the offering is a burnt offering from the flock, from either the sheep or the goats, you are to offer a male without defect. Well, in relation to its fulfillment, the Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 to 19 that knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The Apostle John writes in the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 29 that the next day he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ is therefore in Scripture presented as our Passover Lamb. He is the second Adam, the high priest who enters the temple with his own blood and whose death on the cross resulted in the tearing of the temple veil into two, allowing man to abide in God through Christ. See, Christianity is not humanistic in that man can attain his own salvation. He is not the author of his own saving grace. Instead, it is Christ-centered in that God pours out his grace upon those who repent and believe in him. It is a gift that cannot be earned by works or good deeds. You see, repentance and faith in Christ is not a work, but rather a gift of God, in which the Holy Spirit enables us to turn to God. Because otherwise, if left to our own devices and our own depravity, we will all, our own depravity will always prevent us from turning to God. God, therefore, took it upon himself to liberate us from the power of sin, from our human condition, by sending his son into the created world, that as a second Adam, he could undo the damage of the first. We read this, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And verse 45, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, referring to Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Well, the redemptive narrative of the Bible says more of man's worth and value than the Quran does, in that God took upon himself the suffering for our sins. See, the Christian faith is Christ-centered, not man-centered, because man is not his own Lord or his own uh, authority. The Christian submits not just to the saving grace of Christ, but the Lordship of Christ, who is called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We not only find the salvation of man in Christ, which is the salvation from our sinful nature, from God's judgment, and from eternal damnation, but we also find the restoration of man's purpose on earth, which is to be God's vice regents or his representatives, exercising dominion over the earth while cultivating creation to reflect the glory of God as we extend the kingdom of God. See, Christ is not only God a very God, he is the new dominion man. He is the king and savior, as we find in Psalm 72, and he is bringing all things subject to his lordship. Man is not just delivered from his human condition to enjoy a paradise void of work. In Christ, he is a co-inheritor. He will reign with Christ while subject to his righteous rule, building the kingdom of God as a renewed Eden on earth. What a great destiny that awaits he or she who turns to Christ. Now, to wrap up my opening statement, where Islam fails to make sense of what man is, what sin is, and what the fall of man is, the Christian faith makes sense of man creating the image of God, defines sin as the violation of God's law and man's pursuit to be a law unto himself, which is to be in lawlessness before God, and provides the only means of salvation through Jesus Christ who satisfies the justice of God. Salvation is available to no one else except through Christ. As theologian James White wrote, God's forgiveness is found in its fulfillment of his desire to express his love, mercy, and grace while simultaneously providing an awesome display of his essential justice, righteousness, and holiness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reverend Stephen. Dr. Shabir Ali. Hello everyone. I begin by praising our creator and fashioner. I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers, especially the last of all of them, after whose name uh, Muslims generally say, peace and blessings of God be upon him, or to say that in Arabic, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I am likewise uh, delighted to be in this uh, dialogue here tonight with my good friend uh, Stephen, uh, and I appreciate the respectful manner in which uh, he has addressed us and uh, shared with us uh, his uh, interpretation of uh, the condition of man, uh, the problem we are in, 
and uh, the solution offered by the two faiths. Now, let me begin uh, my own uh, presentation of uh, what I understand to be the human condition. Uh, to me, as we learn from the glorious Quran, human beings have been created honorable. Uh, the Quran says that uh, God has created human beings uh, honorable. Uh, so we do not understand in, in the Islamic faith that human beings are somehow uh, totally depraved, but rather that human beings are given the potential for both uh, good and evil. Uh, the Quran says, Alam najallahu aynain, have me given him two eyes, walisan and washafatain, uh, and a, a tongue and uh, two lips, wahadainahun najdain, and have we not guided him uh, to the two paths? So human beings have before them uh, two paths open, and human beings can pursue either of these two paths. God has given them that potential and privilege, the freedom of choice uh, and free will. At the same time, he has uh, given us that inspiration that will lead us towards good if we were to follow that inspiration. Now, when human beings turn away from divine inspiration, from divine knowledge, from divine revelation and instruction and guidance, uh, something is wrong with that particular human being, but not with humanity as a whole. Uh, so God is then able to complain in the Quran, uh, Malakum, what's wrong with you? Asking human beings, uh, what has turned you away? What has turned you away from your glorious uh, Lord, from, from your generous Lord? So God has created us honorable uh, as a human race on the whole. There is even a hadith that says that God has created Adam in his own image. Uh, so the idea of that, according to Muslim scholars, is not that human beings are somehow shaped like God, who we cannot imagine to have any uh, form that, that uh, can come to the human mind, uh, but rather that human beings are inspired by God with certain good qualities, uh, such as, for example, mercy, kindness, love, generosity, and so on, uh, the positive attributes uh, of, of God except those attributes which are so unique to him that cannot be applied to human beings, such as, for example, his ability to create from out of nothing. So human beings then are not totally depraved in the Islamic tradition. So how do we understand uh, the story of the fall of Adam? Uh, Stephen actually um, referred to that, and his interpretation uh, is based on what some Muslim scholars have said. Let me put it to, to you in my own uh, words and my understanding of the Quran. In the second chapter of the Quran, we are told that when God was ready to create Adam, uh, the angels asked, uh, how, are, are you going to create someone who will uh, cause corruption and shed blood on earth? Uh, and God said to the angels, Inni alamu ma la ta'alamun, I know that which you do not know. Uh, so from that perspective, God is in full control and he knows what is going to happen. Uh, and he knows that he is uh, creating human beings with the potential uh, to commit evil, and if human beings commit evil, then God has a way of controlling that evil, of containing it, of forgiving it, of repairing the world, and uh, uh, allowing human beings to continue with their free volition, uh, knowing that they will continue to sin, but he will continue to forgive them. So that brings us then uh, to the 20th chapter of the Quran, where the story of Adam again is told, and uh, here we find that God says we have not found in, in Adam uh, a constancy. Uh, we did not find him to be like, uh, retentive, uh, but rather he forgot, and so he slipped. Uh, Stephen was right. In Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran, it is mentioned that both Adam and Eve slipped. Uh, the, the Satan caused the two of them to slip, uh, from that state of grace in which uh, they were. But does that mean uh, the end of the matter? No, according to the Quran, as Stephen rightly pointed out, uh, God forgave Adam. Uh, God uh, chose Adam, uh, forgave him, and guided him. So the story in the Quran is not one so much of original sin, but it is one of original forgiveness. For Muslims, this makes sense in that God created human beings, yes, with weakness. God knows that he created us and we're not perfect beings, but we are prone to error. And he allows us to use our free will to choose error if that's what we choose and to fulfill uh, what we, we intend. But at the same time, 
he is ever ready and willing to forgive us, and this is what he does in the Quranic uh, story. Now notice that even if you are to follow uh, the Christian interpretation of things and say that Jesus came and died for our sins, as a result of which God forgives us, well, we still continue to commit sins. And uh, even some good Christians continue to commit sins, and this is a problem uh, that uh, the letters of John struggle with. If somebody says that he has no sin in him, uh, then he is a liar and God's seed is not in him. Uh, but of course we know from uh, our contemporary affairs that sometimes people who are well placed uh, in, in situations of, uh, um, of hierarchy within uh, ecclesiastical organizations nevertheless uh, have moments in which they fall from grace. So the idea that human beings will sin and God will forgive them as often as human beings turn back to God, uh, this not only makes sense theoretically, but also practically on the ground. Now God's plan for human beings is to keep sending prophets and messengers. And uh, we can see both in the Bible and in the Quran that God sends a series of messengers to call people back to God. When people deviate from the right path, they forget the message of God, prophets have come one after another. Many prophets are, are recounted in the Bible and also in the Quranic uh, narrative. The story is that uh, people turn away, God sends a prophet, he calls the people back, uh, people turn back to God, some disobey entirely, and God sometimes in history has uh, uh, caused catastrophes that wiped out uh, whole sets of people who disobeyed God. But there is always a remnant who survives with the prophets and who continue with the message of the prophets to our day. The last of all of these prophets uh, from the Muslim point of view is the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace coming to us with the guidance of the Quran as the final message to all of humankind. Uh, thus abrogating the previous messages which were given to the previous prophets and also at the same time confirming the truth of that message which was revealed to the previous prophets. Now Stephen uh, spoke about the need for a continual sacrifice in order to please God. This is not the uh, Islamic idea entirely. In a, in a previous dialogue, you will recall that I said that there is also the idea of sacrifice in the Islamic tradition. We sacrifice uh, when a child is born. We sacrifice on the day of the great uh, Eid, uh, commemorating the sacrifice of Abraham. But the idea of daily uh, having these animals to be sacrificed in order to be able to approach God, uh, this is obviously not there in the Quran. The Quran takes a different attitude towards the sacrifice. Whereas in the Old Testament we read that when the sacrifice is burnt on the altar, uh, the smell of it goes up into the nostrils of God. Uh, on the other hand, the Quran seems to be responding to what is there in the Bible. Uh, Stephen spoke about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, borrowing. Uh, from the previous scriptures. From an Islamic point of view, uh, I don't think it's accurate to describe this as borrowing. It's, uh, it's making use of that which is true in the previous scriptures, but also, more importantly, uh, from the Quranic point of view, correcting that which was uh, uh, misinterpreted or uh, misread or, or miswritten in the previous uh, narratives. So, from the Quranic perspective, the, it, we cannot say that the smell of the uh, burnt animals go up into the nostrils of God. The Quran in the 22nd chapter tells us, uh, It is not the flesh or the blood of the sacrificial victim uh, that reaches God. What reaches God is your piety. So your devotion at that time, represented by your symbolic slaughtering of the animal, that is what God is looking for. Your intention to please God by giving up something of the wealth and value that is there in your possession when you sacrifice an animal. But more importantly, the Bible speak, speaks about having a contrite heart and a broken spirit. And uh, the, the idea of circumcision is there in the Jewish covenant, uh, but the Bible says that what is needed is for you to circumcise your heart. So uh, by sacrificing the animal, Muslims have the idea that we are not just simply cutting the neck of the animal, but we're cutting away our sinful inclinations and our uh, disobedience of God. And we're turning a new page in life. In fact, for Muslims, this is, without using the same terminology, this is really the circumcision of the heart, turning to God in uh, repentance and in obedience. 
In a previous dialogue, I brought up the question of whether those sacrifices mentioned in the Old Testament were actually uh, really given by God. And I said that the prophet Jeremiah uh, renounced some of these. In, in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 8, and uh, my colleague in dialogue at the time uh, said, well, there are other translations of that verse which indicate that it is not the scripture itself that says that, but it is the pens of the interpreters that turned it into a lie. Uh, but in my further study of this, I see, first, he is right. There are some translations that read that way. Uh, but second, uh, I think I was also right in that this is what the commentators say, that the scripture does indicate that Jeremiah repudiated some of these uh, sacrifices from the Old Testament. He's saying very plainly that these are not from God in Jeremiah chapter 7. George Adam Smith was a lecturer, a university lecturer in the United Kingdom. His uh, lectures on Jeremiah have been compiled in a book, and he said that it's very plain from these uh, statements that Jeremiah is not accepting that these sacrifices were really given by God. Now, this is an important point because our Christian friends believe that Jesus marks the culmination of all of those sacrifices. And, and if those sacrifices were not all given by God, that calls into question the, the status of Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice. Some of the sacrifices that Stephen alluded to, in fact, uh, are not uh, sacrifices necessarily for the forgiveness of sins. Think of, for example, the Passover ritual. The book of Exodus shows that uh, when the Israelites were finally to be rescued from under the domination of the Pharaoh, uh, God instructed them that he is going to come through the land and uh, slay the firstborn of every house. But to protect the houses of the Israelites, what was to be done is that the Israelites should offer a sacrifice and then paint the blood on the doorposts so that when God comes through the land, here we have an anthropomorphic idea of God, when, when God comes through the land, uh, he will see the, the doorposts so marked with the blood, and he will pass over the, those houses. Hence the idea of Passover. So God will pass over those houses and not slay the firstborn child in those houses. So the Israelites did as commanded. God passed through the land, killed the firstborn in every Egyptian house, but not the firstborn in the houses of the uh, Israelite people who so performed the sacrifices uh, dutifully. So now, when in the New Testament, uh, Paul says that Jesus became our Passover, uh, the idea does not actually connect with sins well enough because uh, if Jesus was the final sacrifice to pay for the sins of all humankind, he wouldn't have been a Passover sacrifice. The Passover sacrifice only spared the firstborn son of every house. It did not spare all of humanity from the anger or wrath of God. So I, 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 I'm glad that we're engaged in this dialogue because we obviously have a lot to talk about. Now, in the Quranic picture, how does God deal with the fact of Adam's sins and our sins? The Islamic idea is that God forgives us when we turn back to him. The story of Adam was one of original forgiveness. Our story continues that uh, story of forgiveness. When we sin and we turn back to God, God is ready and willing to forgive us because our sin does not harm God. God certainly is just, but because he knows that he has created us weak, he is ready to forgive us when we turn back to him. And he loses nothing, we lose nothing, nobody loses anything. If we harm somebody else, then we have to repay that harm to the somebody else ourselves. And God forgiving us does not entail that the harm is repaid to the other person. If we have done our best to repay the harm that we have done to other people, then God can forgive us and also compensate the other persons for the harm that is done to them, such harm that has not been uh, previously compensated for. And much compensation will occur in the life hereafter. This helps us to make sense of, for example, a murder for, for which the murderer has not been caught in this life, and he's not been penalized. If we think of Hitler, for example, slaughtering the Jews, uh, what will repay uh, this harm in the life hereafter? 
It is not the, the idea that Jesus died for the sins of the world because those Jewish persons still suffered, they still die, some injustice has still been done. So how can the injustice be paid for or how can things be reconciled? In the life hereafter we are told that God will reward those people who bear sufferings with patience. So if somebody is patient in the light of suffering, then God gives that person a reward uh, for the suffering. To the extent that it is mentioned that even if a, a thorn were to prick the toe of a believer and that person is patient over that harm, then God will give that person a reward for it in the life hereafter. So in the end, everything is just, everything is fair, and God continues to be merciful. Sometimes the idea is that it, it is through the fall of Adam that death entered the world. So because Adam sinned, that's why human beings have to die. But now we know that there were animals on earth long before human beings and dinosaurs were living and dying and eating each other millions of years before human beings came into the world. So there was, in fact, death before the fall and this became actually the title of a book on the, on the subject. The title of the book is Death Before uh, the Fall. Uh, Stephen cited uh, passages from the Old Testament which he thinks point towards uh, this idea of original sin. Psalm 51, verse 5, for example. But Herbert Haig, in his book, Is There Original Sin in Scripture, uh, has shown that, in fact, this is a misreading of that psalm. That in the entire Old Testament, there was no idea that there is an original sin for which somebody has to pay. Otherwise, we would have had that uh, to be the situation when Jesus entered the world. People would have been thinking, oh, finally we got the sacrifice who will pay for our sins. Now, of course, our Christian friends think that this actually happened, such that when John the Baptist uh, uh, announced uh, uh, the presence of Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But notice that this idea is only in the fourth gospel the last of the four to be written. It was not the original idea, but it's a later idea that people arrived at regarding Jesus, and that came to be written into the story as though John the Baptist, uh, Yahya, pronounced it right from the very beginning of Jesus' uh, ministry. Uh, rather, the idea that was taught by Jesus probably is what is found in the Gospel according to Luke. In the Gospel according to Luke, we do not have this idea of redemptive suffering through the atonement of Jesus, but rather we have Jesus dying a martyr's death. He dies as an innocent person, uh, both in Luke and in Acts of the Apostles. And the idea is that people must be seeking forgiveness for their sins. And uh, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus is shown to have told many stories, including the story of the prodigal son, to illustrate this point. Uh, the story of the prodigal son goes like this. There was a man who had two sons. And uh, one of them is, is said to his father, give me my share of the inheritance so I can go my way. And the father gave him, he went his way. He spent his inheritance in sin. Until he was penniless, he took up a job minding pigs, which for Jews, as the story uh, is in that context, would have been one of the most despicable things he could do for life. And uh, eventually he thought to himself, my father has servants who are in a better condition than I am. Why don't I go back to my father and uh, my father will receive me? So he went back to his father, hoping that his father will take him back as a servant, at least. But his father welcomed him with open arms and said, quick, slaughter the fatted, camel, uh, flat, fatted calf so we can have a banquet. And his son who was with him said, father, I was serving you all this time, but you never threw a banquet for me. And the father said, son, you don't understand. This other son was lost, and today he is found. Let's celebrate. Here's a ring. Put it on his finger. Here is a robe. Put it on his body. Let's welcome him. So this story shows that when people turn back to God, repentant, seeking his forgiveness, God is willing to forgive us. He forgives us. He loses nothing, and everything is just and fair and square and merciful in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. So that will bring us to our first round of responses, which will, each speaker will have 10 minutes to respond to the uh, previous speaker's opening statements. Um, so please, Dr. Stephen, forgive to our first round of responses, which will, each speaker will have 10 minutes to respond to the uh, previous speaker's opening statements. Um, so please, Dr. Stephen.
forgive me, reverence. Well, thank you, Shabir, for your opening statement. I mean, there are a lot of things uh, to discuss, and I hope I can cover them all in my first rebuttal uh, within these 10 minutes. And I'll just start by responding to a couple of things you had uh, mentioned in uh, your opening statement. You said that uh, Adam uh, seems to be created in the image of God, uh, according to the Hadith, uh, in that, you know, these qualities of mercy, kindness, and love. But these are, from my understanding, these are all relational qualities, which, in other words, to be a loving person, that, you, that means to be a relational person. You need to be able to have someone to love or someone to be relational with. And prior to creation, there is absolutely nobody. If we're talking about uh, God in Islamic theology, uh, the oneness of God, a singularity. So it, there's a bit of, there's a contradiction there, again, regarding the relational qualities of man as it relates to God. Uh, there's also another question that was raised is, you know, if we, you know, how do come Christians still continue to commit sin? I mean, hasn't their human condition been resolved? Well, there is still a vast difference between the Christian and the non-believer. And by this I meant, uh, if you look at Galatians chapter 5, Paul goes on to list the works of the flesh, uh, which in other words are a lot of the manifestations of our depraved sin nature. But then he also, after that, uh, begins to mention the fruits of the Spirit, which is to say that a Christian um, does not live according to the works of the flesh. Uh, in fact, he's liberated from the power of sin so that he, by the Holy Spirit he may be able to live in a way that pleases God. And one of the ways that that is reflected is by the manifestation of the fruits of the Spirit, such as, you know, love, mercy, kindness, uh, and, and so forth. And so we see that in Galatians chapter 5, uh, where there's also an understanding that we are also still being sanctified. I mean, the Apostle Paul admitted this in his writing, you know, the things he didn't want to do, he still did, uh, as re referring to that he still struggled with his sin nature, his, his human condition. Is that to say that he's still enslaved to it? No, it's the fact that God is still refining him, sanctifying him. It, it's a process. It's not, you know, a, you, know you, you come to Christ, you, you, you become a Christian, you're redeemed, you're forgiven, you're renewed, you're born again, as the scripture says. Uh, suddenly, okay, that means that you no longer have a human condition. Well, no, God still has to work with you, and it's a sanctification process. And yes, we will get to that point where we can reflect the true image of Christ. I mean, there's a lot of other things as well. Uh, he, there was also the mention of sacrifice, the practice of sacrifice in Eid. Uh, well, I believe that sacrifice from Eid is a vestige or a cultural memory from the practice of the sacrifice from Genesis prior to the Tower of Babel. And as, it, as we talk about sacrifice, in Psalm chapter 51, verse 17, about a contrite heart, if we understand that passage within its, its context, we understand it to mean uh, in reference to the sacrifices in that God does not find the light in people who continue in their sin and doesn't turn away from their sin, and yet they offer sacrifice. So as to say, I can continue doing as I want, living a rebellious life, as long as I offer a sacrifice, I know I'm good with God. And God is saying, no, I do not delight in that. In other words, if your heart's not in it, if there is not a repentant, broken, repentant heart before God, a contrite heart, it is not pleasing to him. Nowhere does it say, however, that these sacrifices uh, are not uh, required or are not part of the Old Testament law. Another understanding is the Passover lamb. Well, a lamb was still had to be slain to preserve the lives of the Hebrews for the blood to be put on the doorpost. So that means a lamb had to be sacrificed. Uh, just to, so in, in, in many respects, that is still considered a manner of sacrifice. There's also a mention as to, uh, well, it seems death before the fall, uh, which uh, kind of caught me by surprise, I have to admit. But is, is this how God operates? I assume then that this uh, would entail an acceptance of some form of evolution. Uh, and if so, how can a loving singularity, if there is such a thing, uh, call a creation of death, it, with death, good? Uh, in many respects, does that mean that, you know, is man created then uh, as a historical Adam and Eve, or is he the result of evolution? So, you know, I will, perhaps as a fellow Christian, not very clear on, in the Islamic position, that would be something I'd be interested to know a little bit more about as to where that position is. Um, there was also the mention of the parable of the prodigal son. Well, we Christians, we don't build doctrine on a parable. Why? Because a parable is meant to communicate one central concept, one central message. And if you look at the passage uh, in Luke, uh, in that particular chapter, there are two other messages as well. It's not just about the lost son. You find the lost sheep and you find the lost coin, these parables. And the whole central message is the joy that there is, not only amongst God's chosen people, not only amongst the angels in heaven, uh, but it, it is a joy when something lost is found. That is the central message. So you, it, you can read into a lot of these details of the parables, but we don't build doctrine on parables because it's not for that purpose. It's meant to convey a central point. 
Well, I mean, to better illustrate the biblical teaching of our inherited sin nature, we can turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, which states, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, what does this mean? It means that we are all violators of God's moral law. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, <coughs> what does this imply? that all men exhibit a sin nature. In other words, we're all born with an inclination to deviate from God's absolute moral law. We are prone to wander and prone to manifest our sinful depravity. We find that this accurately corresponds to the real world. This accurately corresponds to man's nature, and therefore this is shown to be true. We find that despite the Quran's suggestion that we are born upright, we can find in the Hadith, uh, Sadi al Bukhari, sorry if I mispronounce it, in book 6, volume 60, number 262, that it states, the prophet said, Moses argued with Adam and said to him, Adam, you are the one who got the people out of paradise by your sin, and thus made them miserable. Elsewhere we read, Adam and Moses argued with each other, and Moses said to Adam, O oh Adam, you are our father who disappointed us and turned us out of paradise. We also read in al uh, Termidi 118 that when Allah created Adam, he touched his back, and there fell from his back every soul that he would create from his offspring. And Adam forgot and ate the fruit of the tree, and so his offspring also forgot, and he, Adam, committed an error, and so did his offspring commit an error. Well, according to Islamic tradition, there appears to have been a contradiction between the Quranic text and the Hadith as it relates to an inherited sin nature. But the argument is often made, why would a just, a just God blame you for a sin you never committed? And yet, according to Islamic belief, Adam forfeited the Garden of Eden because of his sin. Well, if we reject original sin, why, then do we, why do we then suffer the same consequence as Adam? Why can't we return to the Garden of Eden? After all, we are his descendants. Why suffer the consequence of his sin? It appears hypocritical to question this when it is assumed within the Islamic worldview, where we find God in the Bible as the standard and source of justice and righteousness. In the Quran, we instead find a God that manipulates the scales of justice, making no provision for sin. According to the Quran, Allah just forgives people arbitrarily. And if a Muslim performs good works, if those good works outweigh the bad works, then he or she will qualify for paradise. But in the event that your bad works outweigh your good works, Allah will increase the weight of your good deeds by twofold or tenfold. This really is no different from other religions where works are fundamentally perceived as the method of attaining salvation and righteousness. I mean, consider the story of a man, as recorded in the Hadiths, who killed 99 people. This man was guilty of 99 murders, and in his search for redemption, he came across a monk who told him redemption was impossible. Well, he killed him, and he continued on his journey where he met a scholar. Well, before uh, the scholar informs him that there are wise men at a village that can instruct him how he can repent and be redeemed, but before even reaching this destination, he dies, which prompts the angel of God and the angel of punishment to argue as to whether he should be in paradise or in hell. The angel claimed he had no good works. He had killed 100 people. But the angel of God said he was on his way to repentance. Well, what therefore did Allah decree? He decreed that the distance be measured between the man and the village and from where he was coming from. If he was closer to the village where he intended to repent, he would be saved. But if he were farther from the village, then he would suffer in hell. Well, Allah intervened by causing the earth to shrink between, and, uh, between the man and the village so that he was found to be closer to the village, thus leading the angel of God to lift him to paradise. You see, there is no concept of God's justice or central concept of God's holiness in the Quran. Islam presents forgiveness as an impersonal act of arbitrary divine power, as James White writes. And thus, if there is no absolute justice and thus no absolute moral law, then our moral inclination within us is nothing more than a cruel illusion. Now, this poses a problem to the Quran's supposed continuity as held by early Islamic scholarship, as demonstrated in Gordon Nichols' book, Narratives of Tampering in the Earliest Commentaries on the Quran given that there is a complete lack of redemptive continuity and correspondence to the earlier scriptures. What would you expect in the court of law if someone was guilty of murder? If the judge was an accurate reflection of a law, he may pardon the criminal of his crimes, and thus he would no longer be a criminal. Is that justice? Is that not the perversion of justice? Now, there is no penalty for the crime, and this is what we find in Quranic theology, a forgiveness of sin that does not require that the penalty be paid. You see, it is only in the Bible that we find the mercy and justice of God come together in which the love and justice of God are fulfilled on the cross on Calvary and where it is further manifested in the extension of his kingdom on earth. Thank you very much.
conclude our initial response, and we'll move on to our further responses, where each speaker will have five minutes to respond to what has just been said. So we will have... Uh, my apologies, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm very excited. Um, so yes, please, Dr. Shabir, please forgive me. For 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. So I've made some notes so that I can uh, capture the most important points that Stephen has uh, made. Obviously, you can't deal with everything because time is limited. I think one of the most important points he, he made is about the, uh, what he calls the arbitrary nature of God's uh, justice in, in, in the Islamic view. And uh, I say the Islamic view because he has relied on both Quran and Hadith while he said the Quranic view. So we should be clear, are we talking about the Islamic view, uh, which includes all of these, or are we talking about just the Quranic view? I think it's very important for our Christian friends to uh, think about what is the Quranic presentation on things before we go to the Hadith, because uh, it is possible that somebody may be thinking, well, uh, tell me which is the Word of God, and the Muslim says, well, it's the Quran. And the Hadith is the explanation of the Word of God, true, but a, a Christian may be thinking, I want to know what's the Word of God, and what does it actually say? So, for many Christians, the focus should be on the Quran. Hadith comes secondarily as an explanation of the Quran, and some Hadiths are authentic, some are not, some are correctly attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, some are not. So, it is, uh, I think, very important that when Muslims present the message of Islam to the public, they should first and foremost focus on the Quran, and for the public as well, when you want to seek God, you want to know, did God reach down and give us a book? Which is that book? If that is the Quran, show me what it is, and show me what it says in the Quran itself, before we turn to any other uh, source of information. So, in the Quran, is, is God's justice arbitrary? And I say no. I say that God created human beings knowing our weaknesses, and He's willing to forgive those weaknesses. Now, uh, we can think about a university professor uh, who uh, knows that his students have had a, a hard semester, the subject matter has been particularly difficult for whatever reason, maybe there's a new textbook and people are getting accustomed to it, then at the end he says to his students, you know, you have not all done uh, very well, though you've put in good effort, and uh, for the good effort I am willing to upgrade everyone by 5%. So everyone is happy, nobody is harmed, and he has actually done justice to the situation, whereas if he had applied the letter uh, of, of the syllabus, then he would have marked them accordingly, and that would have been unjust. So uh, God knows in his wisdom how to apply his justice, and he does. Mm, let's think about the Christian situation. Does that mean that God is, is just by killing his son? It, it doesn't, to Muslims, uh, imply that, because for, for, um, from my perspective, uh, the, the Christian situation is as if God has a bunch of criminals before him and uh, he uh, is ready to condemn them. He said, criminals, you've all committed sins, uh, you have to die. Uh, but I am merciful, so I have, I'm going to solve this. How? Guards, bring my son. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane, sto Gethsemane story shows that Jesus was pleading for his, uh, to be spared from the cross. Father. Uh, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will but thine be done. Uh, but uh, eventually he submitted himself to the will of God, as the story goes. But, but we can imagine the son coming in, initially pleading, and God saying, no son, you've got to die. Criminals, I love you. So uh, the criminals go free, the son dies. Uh, to Muslims, this does not really reflect justice. Now, what about the story of the, of the man who killed 99, as mentioned in the Hadith? Now, we go to that secondarily. We have to interpret the Hadith in the light of what the Quran has laid down as general principles. Because it is unimaginable uh, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would have been contradicting the very book that was revealed to him as a revelation from God. So, his, the, the words that are reported uh, about him in Hadith should serve as commentary on the Quran, but not to override what is already said in the Quran. So the idea of justice and forgiveness is very clear in, in the Quran. What about the man who killed uh, the 99? Now, if God did not uh, give any compensation to the murder of victims, then of course this will be unjust. But if God in the life hereafter says to a murder victim, I know you've gone through a lot, you have suffered, you have been murdered unjustly, and as a reward for that, I give you this paradise which is ten times the size of the world. 
And the man says, wow, I never imagined anything like that. Let me go back into the world and die one more time so that I can get this sort of reward. Now that man is compensated for the harm done to him. He's happy in the end. And the one who has committed the sin is now forgiven. God loses nothing. The man uh, who committed the crime loses nothing. Uh, the, the murder victim loses nothing but gains in the end. And everybody is happy. Everything is in the end, even Stephen, as I often say. Sorry, uh, Stephen, to use your name like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about Gordon Nickel and his uh, writings about Islam? I've read his Gentle Answer um, and uh, his uh, previous book, uh, which was the subject of his PhD thesis, Narratives of Tampering. And I find that uh, Gordon Nickel is uh, a Christian missionary writing from a particular point of view, uh, trying to defend Christianity. And uh, though he's very polite and gentle, as his, the title of his book indicates, uh, he has misunderstood Islam, seeing it from that particular point of view. Uh, maybe eventually he and I will have a debate, uh, because the word is already going around that we should do that. And, and then we will see how, how that uh, goes. Now, the question that Stephen raised before us is, uh, what about return? Turning to Eden. Well, if Adam committed the sin and then he was driven out of Eden, uh, of the garden of the Jannah, uh, then uh, why, are, why are we still suffering the consequence of that? Well, from the Quranic point of view, it seems that this was God's initial plan. Because even though he forgave Adam, he still says to them, now you are to go to earth, uh, this, is, uh, this is the place where you are to live for a certain time which would indicate that his placement in the original garden was only for a, a particular purpose. It was not for everlasting life. Uh, other passages of the Quran show that human beings are actually created uh, to be on the earth and to live on earth uh, for the duration of their lives. So this is God's uh, master plan. Uh, in fact, uh, it might surprise some Muslims that uh, the classical commentators uh, discuss whether that original garden was one in, in a heavenly realm or actually a garden on the earth itself. And some said that it's actually a garden on the earth itself. Uh, but that, that question does not affect our topic much. The question is still, why didn't we return back into that original garden? And the answer could be, especially if it is a garden on this earth, that humankind could not all live in that one original garden especially if it was between the Ma Bain and Nahrain, as it says, uh, in, in the Mesopotamian uh, region between the two rivers. Uh, the, the, the book of Genesis shows that uh, it was between four uh, rivers. Well, you know, you can't have all the human beings live in that original garden. We have to spread out, uh, multiply, and uh, populate the earth. This is what we have done. But we can also turn the question back to our Christian friends and ask, why aren't we back in the original garden? And why aren't we back forget garden, in the original situation in which human beings were before the fall. Now, when St. Paul and others came up with this idea that with the sacrifice of Jesus, everything is going to be made right, they thought this is the end of, war, of the world. It's going to happen any time now. Jesus is going to come back in our lifetimes. He's going to uh, take up the, the ones who have been dead previously. They're going to come back to life. And those of us who are still alive will be raptured up into heaven. This is how St. Paul spoke about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. He thought that this will happen in his own lifetime. That means, as they were saying, that sin was going on for a long time, and now at the end of the ages... God's Son has come in to set it all right. He's come and he's paid the final sacrifice. Everything is going to be back to normal. They thought it's going to be back to normal, but of course another 2,000 years have passed and we're still in the same situation. So the question is put back to Stephen. Why aren't we back in Eden uh, seeing that Jesus has paid the final price? Uh, more than this, if Jesus has paid the price for all of us, doesn't that mean that we all go free? Because we have committed sins, uh, God demanded his pint of blood, he got it, uh, we should all be free, right? Uh, but no, we still have to have a contrite heart, a broken spirit, we still have to give up sins, we have, still have to do the right thing, we still have to serve God. Well, that was what we had to do before, either before or after the sacrifice. So the sacrifice of Jesus has not actually changed anything, and I believe that this is uh, an important problem uh, for us to deal with. I have a half minute more to go, uh, but uh, I don't want to be contentious and use up all of the time arguing. I want to hear from Stephen as well, so I'll close at this point and uh, invite my colleague to enlighten us more.
Thank you. That will conclude our initial round of responses, and we'll move on to the, the next part, which will be the further responses, where each speaker will have five minutes to respond. And um, we will start with Reverend Stephen. Yeah, so it, it's it, it, some great questions there. I mean, uh, I just want to clarify as to why I do refer to the Hadiths, uh, including as well as the Quran. It's because I have met many Muslims who do regard the Hadith as authoritative. So I do acknowledge that there is diversity in the Islamic community as to, you know, some people believe that it's just equally authoritative as the Quran. Others believe it is secondary. Uh, but nonetheless, it does reflect the Islamic uh, community's beliefs in many respects and their understanding in its readings. Um, just the, in terms of the question that he's turned to me at, why aren't we back in Eden? Well, my friend, it, it, it's coming. I mean, that's, that's what we read in es ecclesiology, uh, sorry, eschatology, uh, the, the study of the end times as we read throughout Scripture. Um, yes, there were many Christians who thought that the end of the world had come, but the truth was that, you know, it didn't. And why? Well, no one knows the time and the hour when, when Christ will return again. Uh, but the thing is, God is working throughout history. God is bringing all things, Christ is bringing all things subject to him. All things are being brought subject to Christ so that when he comes, in other words, the, the earth will be as a renewed Eden. I mean, this is the, uh, this is the eschatological view of the church uh, of the end times of, of Christ's coming, that after the judgment, we're not just going to be in some uh, place where we're just going to be relaxing up in heavens with the clouds. No, that's not, that's not the biblical view at all. Uh, we do believe that God's kingdom on earth, a renewed Eden uh, throughout all the earth where there is no more death. So, my friend, that is coming. That is, in fact, and I would encourage you, you, you to, to look into a little bit more of the eschatological views uh, as expressed by the Christian community. Um, the idea regarding the problem with the atonement, well, the idea that someone else can bear your sins is quite obviously not a concept found nor accepted in Islam, and it shouldn't be understood as that just about anyone can bear another's sin, because according to the biblical narrative, it could only be one who was without blemish, perfect, and upright. Well, according to St. Athanasius, only the assumption of humanity by one who is himself fully divine could affect a change in this creaturely state. You see, by becoming human, human and living a human life, the divine word who is in himself the true image of God restored the image of God that is marred in us. But I often find Muslims to be arbitrary in rejecting the biblical doctrine of atonement when Allah permits that someone can go on, your, on behalf to Mecca as part of the Hajj, the pilgrimage. At least that's what I've been told in my conversations with fellow Muslims. Uh, and that's in the case if you are sick or financially incapable of going. Well, why can Allah accept that someone goes in your place fulfilling one of the five pillars of Islam, but the same principle cannot be applied to the substitu substitutionary atonement that we find in the biblical narrative? I mean, there does not appear to be any reason why Allah permits substitution for the fulfillment of the Hajj and not the other for man's atonement for, of sin. I mean, this I see as inconsistency, the arbitrariness of Islam. Uh, I mean, is God cruel to send his son as a sacrifice for sinners? I mean, does man have the right to judge God's character? Can man's perception of God change the character of God? Well, if we are created by God, then we have no right, nor are we capable of judging God. We are subject to his judgment, not the other way around. And what we want to believe about God does not really determine what his character is. I mean, we can think him cruel or barbaric, but that does not mean that he is cruel or barbaric. I mean, we ought to also consider on what basis man could determine what is right and wrong and what is loving and cruel when he does not have the law and word of God. I mean, he essentially has no standard or foundation by which to make such value distinctions, and I speak of this in man in general. I mean, if we are going to question the character of God, we should also question the God of Islam, who is likewise perceived by many to be cruel and barbaric. Uh, I mean, is it not true, after all, that according to the Hadith, the converted Muslim who performs good works must still endure hell for the purification of his sins? Uh, I mean, is this not what many Muslims believe as it pertains to salvation, and that the prophets and martyrs are the only ones exempt from that purification process? I mean, why is it that we believe that, in fact, that Christians can be born again, and, you know, how is it that we understand that man, uh, in fact, is different after coming to Christ? I mean, we look at that, that's another uh, aspect of the response as well. Well, again, it, it is only possible because Christ, in fact, comes as the God-man. It is called, understood as the hypostatic union in which uh, we find this in the Council of Chalcedon in uh, 451 AD, in which the council wrote that according to the biblical text, Jesus was truly man of a reasonable, rational soul and body, consubstantial, coessential, of the same substance with us according to the manhood. You see, Christ was to be acknowledged in two natures, in confusity, unchangeably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved. In essence, Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man at the same time, in which the hypostatic union could be expressed being perfectly God and perfectly man. And it's 
uh, only the reason that he, we are able to be saved from our, our, our religious, our human condition, and we can see the fruits of the Spirit is because he is the Son of God. Not, he's not just some man. He is God that came in human flesh, that took on human flesh, the second person, the Trinity. I wish there was more time, but unfortunately, uh, this is now the end of the second rebuttal. Thank you very much. Uh, after this, we're going to have a break, and the MC will... Uh, uh, in, in, inform us about what follows from that. Uh, so in this uh, final speech, I wanted to be reconciliatory and, and say that uh, I, I'm so glad that we had this dialogue here tonight. I believe that Muslims and Christians have a lot in common. We need to celebrate that which is common. And uh, at the same time, we need to understand the differences. But at the end of the night, uh, I want Muslims and, and Christians to walk out of here as, as friends. And uh, we should continue to study the subjects and understand uh, the issues uh, as the best we can. But many of the issues cannot be settled in this life. They will be left uh, to God in the life hereafter to inform us, as the Quran says, about the things that we differed about in this life. Uh, there is much violence in the world, and we need more peace. There is discord. Uh, we need accord and agreement. So. Let me answer Stephen's uh, questions to me. Uh, what about the hadith which indicates that uh, some Muslims may actually have to go through uh, hell for their sins? Well, that actually shows that there is a justice. If God does not forgive you, then you will suffer for, for your sins, and you suffer yourself. Nobody suffers for somebody else. لا تزر وزر أخرى. No bearer of burdens is going to bear the burden of somebody else. The Quran is fair about this. But the idea in the Quran is that God will forgive you. And if somebody is not forgiven, it's because he did not uh, turn back to God uh, and seek forgiveness. If he did, he would have been forgiven. He wouldn't have to pass through hell. What about Hajj battle or the uh, compensatory Hajj, where somebody performs the Hajj on behalf of somebody else uh, who is infirm and cannot go through the physical processes? And the reason for that is that, as Muslim scholars explain, uh, Hajj involves a sacrifice uh, of the human uh, endeavor and also a financial sacrifice. Some people are capable of the financial sacrifice but not of the physical. So somebody else can perform the physical sacrifice on their behalf and, and th this person is just basically responsible for the financial portion which they bear. So it is fair and square in, in this way. Notice I didn't say even Stephen this time. <laughs> Now, in, in Stephen's uh, first speech, he compared the God of Islam with the God of Christianity, uh, and, and he said uh, that the God of Islam is not uh, understandable, but in his own words, he said that the God that he's speaking about is intelligible to the human mind. These are the words I wrote down when he spoke them. Uh, but uh, as the evening progressed, I felt that he was talking about a God who is not actually intelligible to the human mind. Because he speaks about Jesus being fully God and fully man at the same time. This to me is a contradiction in terms because it involves being perfect and imperfect at the same time. And uh, this is uh, an, a, a, an internal contradiction. Moreover, he says that uh, the one who dies for us has to be fully divine. As if God himself has to come down and die for us. But if God comes down and dies for us, then God died. And uh, if we're not going to admit that God died, then we shouldn't say that God died for us. Now, if you say that God is actually three persons and one of the persons died, do we have one minute left? Uh, uh, if, if we say that God is three persons and one of the persons died, it would mean that one of the persons is expendable. And uh, God, by definition, is not expendable. And all three persons should have all of the qualities of God, meaning that he is not expendable. Uh, so there is a problem there. The question is, who exactly is God? And in Islam, the idea is very clear. There is only one God, the same one God who spoke to the great prophets of the past, who spoke to Abraham, to Moses, and to Jesus. And it is the God who was worshipped by Abraham and Moses and even by Jesus. We have in the New Testament that Jesus fell on his face and prayed to God. Just as Muslims to this day fall on their faces and pray to God. Who was Jesus praying to if he himself was God? And if it's only his human person that was praying, that means that there is a separation between his human person and the divine person. And it would mean then that God did not actually become a human being. He must have just simply dwelt inside of a human being. So we have a distinctive human being who's called Jesus, and we have God who is somehow inside him who may come out and leave Jesus as a human being. And I don't think that that is the, the, the definition of divinity from the Council of Chalcedon, which uh, Stephen was referring to. So in the end, it seems to me that the God of Islam is a clear concept 
and the God of Christianity is not so clear, and it becomes confusing when we think about who precisely died for our sins and who died on the cross. Rather than having God die for us, let's say that God forgives us, and let us all turn back to God repentant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So that will bring us to our break. We're going to have a little bit of an intermission. We will have uh, about half an hour or so, um, 15 minutes of that will be dedicated to our Mahrib prayer or our evening prayer. Uh, we ask uh, all our guests and uh, our fellow brothers and sisters when we're at that time and we have heard the call to Adan and we are praying, uh, we ask everyone to just keep our voices a little bit, uh, a little bit lower and uh, it, to remain silent would be optimal, um, just to give the respect of the people who are praying, to let them focus and keep their concentration. Um, there will be some snacks at the back, guys, and uh, you feel free to grab some tea, some drinks, socialize amongst yourselves. If you have any questions, the volunteers will be going around at that time as well. Um, just give them a tap on the shoulder, they'll have some pens and some pads. You'll see they'll have a black shirt with some green writing, it says volunteer in big. Um, they'll gladly give you some pen and paper. and. Uh, we'll get those questions to us and we'll filter through them and, and keep them guys please on today's topic. Um, so with that being said to everybody that's here in the audience, to the people that are tu tuning in wherever you guys are online, um, come back in about uh, half an hour at about 8 o'clock and at about 7.37 we're going to hear a call to prayer and at that time we'll have about 5-10 minutes of silence please guys and it's greatly appreciated. And uh, that'll conclude this portion. Thank you very much. Dr. Ali, Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, ayat number 70, that we have honored the children of Adam, and we have carried them in the lands and the seas, and we have given them many things, and we have preferred them over many things that we created with preference. This implies that we are not perfect over all creations. The scholars, including Ibn Taymiyyah, thinks this is proof of aliens. Where does this put our status as humans, as this, as this verse states that we are not the greatest of creations? Dr. Ali? And we'll, we'll allot about uh, three minutes for each question. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad this question was asked because it ties in with what I presented when I said that God uh, honored uh, the, the children of Adam, and the, the verse says the same thing. Uh, now, it, it's, it's in Islamic uh, understanding that human beings are the best of all of God's uh, creation. I don't think that's anything in this verse that, uh, that negates that belief. Uh, but there is no specific statement that I know of that uh, says that um, uh, the human beings must necessarily be the best of all of God's creation. Human, Muslim scholars have debated whether in fact uh, mo uh, human beings are better than angels or angels are better than human beings. So that, that's a, a long debate. We don't need to settle the issue here. The, the, more for our topic, uh, are human beings in a good relationship with God such that uh, if we sin, God is willing to forgive us? That The Islamic answer is yes. And uh, does that make God just and fair? The Islamic answer is yes, because God compensates the victims uh, or he requires us to compensate. And if we do not compensate, then if he wants to forgive us, he still has a way of forgiving uh, human beings. Uh, God has created human beings and, and placed them on earth a, as a testing ground. Uh, so yes, our deeds will be weighed in the life hereafter, as Stephen had mentioned in his opening presentation. And if we have more good deeds than bad, then we go to paradise. Uh, if uh, less uh, good deeds than bad, then of course, uh, unless we are forgiven by God, then we go to the other place. But uh, in the Islamic understanding, humans are not makers of their own destiny in that ultimate manner. Yes, we choose our paths, but God finally it gives us, by his grace, the opportunity to enter his paradise. It's not so much because we deserve it by our good deeds, but God has graced us to perform good deeds and to enter into his mercy and kindness. It's got probably one minute response. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Shabir. I thank you for whoever asked the question. I just do want to clarify as to this, the, 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 what the Bible says in respect to, to man. Well, he, I mean, it's very clear that man is created in the image of God, and this what we refer to when I say man is both male and female. Uh, they're created in the image of God as his vice regents, and it was always meant to reflect the perfection of Christ, the perfection of God. Uh, I mean, that's very clear as to why man in Scripture is elevated. He is the crown of all creation because no other created object in the created world can say that they were created in the image of God. Um, again, as just a response, quick response to Shabir uh, and, and according to his presentation as well, again, we have, uh, if you compare the Bible and its text uh, about God and, and the Christian theology, and you compare that with Quranic theology, again, you find a very a huge disconnect where you find a, a, a holiness and righteousness, righteousness not as something required, not as something that uh, works together, but rather you see uh, uh, arbitrariness. You, you don't see justice uh, exemplified in the law. Instead, what you find, uh, again, is mercy, but just completely disregarding justice, which is what you don't find in the Scripture. In the Christian Bible, you do find justice and mercy coming together at the foot of the cross. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Our, our next question is to both of our parties. So if we would uh, both allot three minutes. Um, and it's, we spoke a little bit, uh, both of you guys spoke a little bit earlier about... Um, heaven and hell and what the purpose is. Um, and there, uh, and uh, this person is just asking, what, it, what is the purpose of this as, as man, um, as humanity? Well, what is the ultimate, why, is there these things? And, and what are their purpose? Heaven and hell, they're asking. Um, who would like to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, what is the purpose of man? And I'll, I'll relate uh, as well, uh, heaven and hell. Um, just an understanding, I mean, what was man created originally to do? He was created as God's vice regent, his representative. Uh, and what was he given? He was given what's called a cultural mandate, which we find uh, throughout Reformed uh, tradition uh, and commentaries on, in Scripture. What we find is that man was created to cultivate God's creation to, to reflect the glory of God. Um, so an understanding of that, in other words, is that we were always meant to cultivate creation. We were always meant to, what does that mean? It means cultivating culture uh, in a way that reflects the truth of the gospel, reflects the truth uh, of the Christian scriptures uh, in a way that glorifies God, uh, not in cultivating a culture of death as we often see, for example, in our culture today, a culture of nihilism uh, as a result of, of naturalism and hum secular humanism that has taken uh, the reins, uh, but instead cultivating a, a Christian culture, a culture that reflects the of God that honors and pays tribute to the Lordship of Christ. Um, but I'll, now, now connecting that to heaven and hell, you know, what, what is that? Well, I have to, want to make a very clear clarification. Heaven is not this place full of clouds that you suddenly, when you die and you happen to be a believer, you go up there and you just, you know, sit uh, on a nice cloud and you wait there for the rest of eternity in paradise. That's not what heaven is. Uh, heaven is always understood uh, scripturally to me that you'll be in the presence of God, uh, but that's, uh, in terms of, well, that wherever that might be, that, that's not going to be the, the case for eternity. Eschat uh, when you look at the eschatology of scripture, God, uh, we're going to be with Christ, we're going to be in the presence of God, but on earth uh, upon Christ's return. We're going to see a new earth. We're going to see a new heavens. Uh, there will be a literal reign of Christ on earth. Uh, and so that, you know, we're, we're being repurposed. We're, our, our purpose is being restored in Christ because our image of God was effaced due to sin. Christ undoes the damage of the first Adam. He restores our image, which in other words, restores our purpose uh, to cultivate God's creation, to glorify God but what about the question of hell? What about those who did not repent and who did not place their faith in Christ? Uh, well, hell, quite obviously, I mean, if, if God creates a being, and, 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 which is man, and man does not obey God, but rather proceeds in rebellion against God, God has every right, and, is, and in fact, it is demanded of his perfect, just nature that that punishment must ensue as a result of that rebellion, as a result of that disobedience, and that's why, that's hell there. I mean, it, hell was not originally designed for man, it was originally for fallen angels, but as a result, as a result of man's sin, man's sin condemns him to eternal damnation, 
And that's why we see the grace and the mercy of God presented through the gospel, through Christ's coming, who died on the cross. It wasn't God that died. It was his, his physical body, his human body that died and perished. But his, his, the fact that he, ra- he was raised again from the dead on the third day is what gives us hope. It's, it's the affirmation of the victory over sin, over death. And what we see is the hope of the gospel. And that is the grace of God to liberate us, not just from condemnation uh, in eternity, but also to restore our purpose as God's vice regents on earth. Uh, together with Stephen, I, I, I would uh, agree that uh, we need a purpose. Human beings have to have a purpose. And if we take religion out of the picture and the atheistic worldview, uh, there is no purpose. You can make a purpose in life if you want to, but uh, you don't have to. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the, the, the religions, uh, especially the great world religions and especially the Abrahamic faiths, uh, give people a sense of direction, a sense of hope, and a sense of purpose for which uh, to live as human beings. Uh, having said that, uh, what is the purpose of human uh, life on earth? The Quran makes two important statements about this. One is the statement that Muslims know generally, which says that God created humans and jinn to worship him. And then the question that arises from that, well, you know, does God need people to worship him? That's why he created us to worship him. The answer to that seems to be in the other statement that I'm thinking of, which is in the 11th chapter of the Quran, Surah uh, Hud, uh, where it uh, says, وَلِذَلِكَ uh, خَلَقَهُمْ And for that he created them. Now, the dhalika, that, uh, follows from the mention of mercy, which was uh, just in the previous verse. So, it, it, putting it all together, it seems that God created human beings for his mercy. And we can think of the mercy of God as an overflowing fountain. And so, if you think of a fountain of water, and the water is always overflowing, so the mercy of God is like that, always overflowing. So, who is there to receive that overflowing mercy? God created human beings to receive that mercy. I think that's the best way of uh, putting it. So now, uh, what is the way of receiving that mercy? Uh, Through worshiping God. Uh, It's like when we worship God, we are connecting with his mercy. It's almost like you want water in your house. Well, how are you going to get water in your house? The water is in some main supply somewhere, so you have to open your tap in in your house in order to get the water coming into your house. So the, the Uh, The worship of God is like opening that tap. When you worship God, you are connecting with his mercy and receiving his mercy. So the statements are all put together. God created us to worship him, not for his sake, but for our sake, as our way of connecting with him so that we can receive the mercy that he created us for. And that is paradise. Paradise is the expression of God's mercy. So when we are admitted into paradise by the grace of God, which often is conferred uh, on an individual as a reward uh, for that individual's good deeds and avoidance of sins, uh, then that uh, is a way of finally receiving ultimately uh, the grace and the mercy of God. Will that paradise be uh, in a renewed earth, uh, which obviously will have to be much bigger and greater than this one, or or in another place which uh, God has created specially? Uh, I don't think that's a very important dispute. The the question is, will we get the bliss from God in the life hereafter to be enjoyed forever? And this is my belief. Yes, we will. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Our last question for tonight will be regarded to Reverend Stephen. And I like the fact that the, the, the person who posed this question put the name of, or the title of tonight's lecture, I, I really appreciate that. So we know it's, it's about something related to tonight's topic. Um, you mentioned earlier that, um, that Jesus was fully a human and fully a God, i.e. a hypostatic union, quote unquote. In the light of this, can you, can you, can you explain what do you understand by the hierarchy described in Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3? Uh, first Corinthians. While our guest is finding his, his page so he can properly um, 
answer the question. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, keeping the questions on topic. And I do apologize sincerely for the questions that we haven't gotten to ask uh, that aren't related to the topic, um, out of respect for, for our guests for tonight. And um, if, you f if you feel and you really want to answer the questions, um, uh, I'm pretty sure both of our guests will be here for shortly after, and you can ask them in, in person if they're willing to answer. Um, are you ready, yes. Revan? Please. Uh, I thank you for your patience. Quite obviously, I need to read the passage for myself as opposed to trying to recall it by memory and mistaking it. Uh, and it just for those who are asking, I'm not sure what it says. It says, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. Now, I'm, obviously, the question here is in reference to this part, God is the head of Christ. What does it mean? Does it mean then that Christ is not one with God? That's not exactly what it's saying. But if you, you can't take a passage and then suddenly remove it from the context of the entire biblical text. Uh, when you understand it in its context, uh, in other words, reconciling it with the whole of Scripture, we understand the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, and therefore understanding the relationship of the Trinity, which is what God one being but in three persons, uh, one in one sense, three persons in another sense. And understanding the relationship then of the persons of the Trinity where Christ being the Son is therefore subject to the Father. Uh, he is not inferior to the Father. He is equal with uh, the Father because he is God. It's the Holy Trinity. But however, uh, at his office as the Son is uh, therefore subject to God as the Father. And obviously we, we do see that. Uh, we see that relationship in the Holy Trinity. And I do have to admit and I do willingly uh, say, as many other Christian commentators say, that we can't exhaustively know the Trinity because it is, in fact, a it is, in fact, uh, one of those mysteries of God. Um, and one of the th things that we need to keep in mind, obviously, is that we are finite beings. Uh, therefore, uh, trying to contemplate such things such as eternity is something very difficult for a finite mind or a, a, a human being living in a finite world. Uh, and it's in many respects, as well, understanding the Trinity in its exhaustiveness. Well, if that were to be so, if we were to know the Trinity and how it works exhaustively, uh, well, then God would cease being God because God is in fact far greater than our intellect, far greater than, uh, I'm not saying beyond it, but I am saying he is far greater and there are certain mysteries that we do not yet know, only what is revealed therefore in scripture. Uh, but in terms of this passage in particular, there is no contradiction. Uh, Christ in his office, uh, not only referring to his relationship in the Trinity, but also when he came as, as in the form of man, he also submitted, he submitted himself to the Father and to the will of the Father. Uh, so that needs to be understood as well in its relationship to the Gospels. Thank you. For my one minute response to that very quickly, uh, what I see happening here is that uh, th there has been a development of the idea regarding Jesus over time. Uh, Jesus to Muslims was, was a human being, and historically this is how it is established. But we can see over history that uh, people started to exaggerate his position. First of all, referring to him as the Son of God, meaning it in a metaphorical manner. Then later on, taking that literally and saying that he's literally the Son of God. And then thinking that, well, if he's the Son of God, then he must be God. And this is how eventually it is announced in the councils uh, to which uh, Stephen had referred in his uh, earlier speech. For example, the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451. But what we find in Paul's writing here is part of that development, where Paul uh, regards Jesus as a sort of divine being, but under the Father, not co-equal with the Father, and, and definitely uh, not part of a Holy Trinity because the idea of the Trinity was not fully developed yet. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I do apologize. Um, I felt I had to ask the question because personally, um, I'm not that familiar with Corinthians, Corinthians and what was said there, so I wanted to vocalize the question out of respect for who, who wrote it. I mean, it had the topic, but uh, forgive me, I, I feel once we re out read that out loud as he was reading it, um, if I ask forgiveness from, from you guys and from the guests, uh, for, from you, Reverend, and, and from the audience, that, that was a little bit off topic, so I do apologize for that. So in light of keeping to our, our topic, we will call that an end for tonight, and we will have of the question and answer sir, a portion of tonight, and we will have our closing remarks. We'll have each speaker have five minutes to conclude tonight's event, and um, who would like to go first? Would you like to stay on the same? Our Reverend will go first. Thank you. Shabir and uh, the, the mosque as well for opening its doors and, and having this dialogue. Uh, to be honest, there are not many mosques that would open its doors to have a dialogue on its premises, and I'm uh, quite happy to see that there is that openness of discussion and dialogue here. 
Uh, I hope you've gone to see, and, and as this has proceeded as well, that you've noticed perhaps a clash of worldviews. So clearly, we are, I do not see eye to eye on many things, but not a clash of persons. Uh, in that I do respect and I do love Shabir, uh, and quite obviously, as a Christian minister, I do want to see Shabir come to Christ and be saved. Uh, I want him to see the truth of the gospel. Uh, but nonetheless, thank you uh, for opening your doors, and thank you for your hospitality as well. Well, despite an apparent contradiction between the Quran and the Hadith, as we had seen, as to whether man does bear the image of God or not, Consistency to the Quranic teaching insists that man is not created in the image of God, and thus in dismissing man's likeness to God, he essentially becomes unintelligible to the human mind. Now, man is a relational being. He is a being capable of having loving relationships, but how can a singularity, which by principle must be a non-relational being, create a relational being? Well, if we cannot know God, then we cannot know anything about his creation because God is so other that he is unintelligible. And thus the Quran, as the word of God, fails to make sense of what man is because logically it must also be unintelligible to the human mind. Well, if man is not created in the image of God as communicated in the biblical text, and as I mean as defined by the biblical text, then what is he? And what, man makes, him, uh, what makes him different from all other objects in the created world? The Quran also fails to detail what the exact sin is by Adam in the Garden of Eden, and besides the natural consequence of death that follows as a result of sin, no immediate forfeiture of life is required for Adam's disobedience. In essence, the righteousness of God is not taken as seriously in the Quran as it is in the Bible. The Quran's position on man being born upright without sin is, in other words, contrary to the doctrine of original sin in the Bible, as was discussed, that all men are born with a sin nature. But from the Christian scriptures, we can see that God made man upright in his image, but the result of his human condition is because of his sin in the Garden of Eden. In other words, we are not what we ought to be because of our sin, and particularly because of Adam. However, the Quran appears to imply, as some have interpreted it to mean, that man was created weak, subject to being enticed, misled, and forgetful. His human condition is, in other words, a part of his created nature. Well, what can solve our human condition? Well, Islam is just another incarnation of religious humanism, from my understanding, and by which righteousness and salvation can be attained by good works. Man, in other words, can deliver himself, even if he so much professes the shahada. But for the Quran to claim continuity and correspondence to the earlier scriptures, which is attested by various scholars, there is a severe disconnect in that both the biblical text and the Quran disagree theologically and historically, especially as it concerns man, God, and redemption in Christ. See, the Christian worldview, however, does adequately define man as being created in the image of God, by which man's worth is determined by the one whose image he bears. It accurately describes the human condition as a result of our sin nature and its root in the Garden of Eden where man's sin was to be his own God, to be independent from God. From the moment man sinned, death as the penalty was required, and it was paid by God slaying an animal to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. See, the sacrifice of the Old Testament were to cover one's sins, but it all foreshadowed the atonement once and for all, which the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, when Christ had offered for all, sorry, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. We could not deliver ourselves or liberate ourselves from our human condition, as is the central idea of all utopian and humanistic pursuits. Only God can save man, liberate him from the power of sin, and restore him to his purpose as God's vice-regents, co-inheritors with Christ in the kingdom of God. The redemptive narrative of the Bible says more of man's worth and value than the Quran does in that God took upon himself the suffering for our sins. And essentially, where Islam fails to make sense of what man is, what sin is, and what the fall of man is, the Christian faith makes sense of man created in the image of God, defines sin as the violation of God's law and man's pursuit to live in lawlessness as a law unto himself, and provides the only means of salvation through Jesus Christ, who satisfies the justice of God. God bless you, and thank you for having us tonight.
So finally, as we come to the close, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to thank you all for coming out to, to our Islamic Center uh, for this dialogue here tonight. And I want to thank Stephen for accepting to uh, be partner with me in this dialogue as we try to share our ideas, our research, and our understanding of Scripture and God with each other. Now, as we come to the close, I want to draw together the strings of this dialogue and see where we have traveled. Uh, in this sense, uh, uh, while I, I do appreciate uh, Stephen's presentation and his uh, skills as an orator, I, I would have preferred that he put aside his uh, written speech and, and try to gather the, the ideas that were discussed in the manner in which the ideas flowed, interacting with the things that I said. Uh, you will notice that in our uh, discussion tonight, uh, the, the clarity of the Islamic uh, principles actually became evident. First, that there is only one God, and when we say one, we really mean one, and there is no confusion or lack of uh, clarity about who we're referring to when Muslims say Allah or when they say God. Second, that God created human beings uh, for his mercy and to worship him, place them on this earth as a testing ground holding for them the promise of eternal life in paradise, uh, coming from his grace, but given uh, often in response to the human being's good deeds, their avoidance of sins, and especially their repentance. We, we have uh, discussed uh, that if human beings commit wrong on this earth, God has a way of repairing that wrong. If we harm others, we are required to repay the harm to others and also ask God for his forgiveness. And if we do not repay the harm to others, God can compensate the victims of our crimes and still forgive us so that everything in the end comes out even and fair. Yes, God is merciful and he is also just in this system. Now, if we turn to the Christian ideas which uh, Stephen presented, we find that some of these ideas are great sounding ideas, but uh, when we probe them deeply, we, they, they reveal uh, some incoherence. Like it's great to say, okay, somebody died for my sins. That sounds nice. It's great to say that God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a beautiful sounding verse, especially to those who have been reading it all their lives. But now when you think about the concepts, uh, you, you realize that uh, down at the bottom, they do not cohere. Uh, so, for example, if you say that the only person who could have died for our sins is one who is without blemish and he must be a God himself, and then in the end you say, well, it's not God that actually died, it's only the human body that died, and this human body is not eternal. This human body is a body that was prepared for God to come into in this world, well then, this is not the eternal God that died for your sins. So you start out by saying that God died for your sins, you end up by saying that God did not die for your sins. We have seen that for God to be God, he must be, as the Quran says, Hayyulayamut, he is living, he does not die. And for any one of the three persons in the uh, Trinity to be God, he must have all of the essential attributes of God, which means that he must be ever living and he cannot die. And yet we are being told that one of the persons of the Trinity died, uh, which would mean that he's expendable, but God is not expendable. Now we have seen that while uh, Stephen was very much concerned about the justice of God and he doesn't want God to be arbitrary, uh, at the same time what uh, he presents is a, a picture in which God to Muslims appeared to be unjust in that God penalizes an innocent person in order to let the guilty ones go free. And uh, the Muslims are saying, well, if God wants the guilty persons to go free, then let him free the guilty persons, and he does not have to kill his son, who is an innocent person. In fact, justice is not done anywhere in the world where, in order to let a person go off of death row, we grab an innocent person and kill him instead. That would be gross injustice if it's done in our world, and it is also gross injustice if it's done on the cosmic scale, if it is done in the divine realm. So for Muslims, it seems very clear that uh, human beings are created for a good purpose. God created us to receive his mercy through worshiping him, and uh, if we fail and falter, we have a way of turning back to God, asking for his forgiveness, and the Quran assures us that he is forgiving, he is merciful, he is kind, and he will forgive us for our sins. So I ask you here tonight, and I ask myself, 
Let us turn back to God. Let us ask for his forgiveness. We say, God, please forgive us. Thank you all. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So that will conclude tonight's program. I uh, will invite everybody to hang around for a little bit uh, for some further discussion amongst yourselves, a couple uh, treats, some snacks, and, fall, and we'll continue on with uh, what was going on during the, our intermission. Um, with that being said, I would like to thank all our guests for their participation in tonight's program. I would like to thank the little ones for remaining quiet throughout the whole time. That was amazing. Good job, guys. I would like to thank Reverend Stephen Martins for being our guest and taking time out of his busy schedule to come and speak with Dr. Shabir Ali. I would like to thank Dr. Shabir Ali for taking time out of his schedule and for being here tonight and being part of this discussion. I would like to thank the event organizers. I would like to thank the Islamic Info and Dawah Center team. I would like to thank the broadcast and media team, all our viewers online, overseas, wherever you guys are. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I would like to thank GlobalMuslimForums.com, where all our online videos can be seen. Everything that happens here at the Dawah Center is go to GlobalMuslimForums.com, and we'll have all the videos posted there for later viewing. Um, the catering team, all the viewers, everybody, thank you very much. I would like to, last but not least, I would like to thank the guys, our team running around, our volunteers, taking questions, helping with the setup, helping all our guests feel welcome. The volunteers, guys, thank you for your hard work, your ded dedication. Without everybody that I just me mentioned, if I forgot anybody, guys, from the bottom of my heart, please forgive me. I would like to humbly thank everybody, and at this point, I would like to invite everybody to our next monthly lecture series that will be on April 30th. It will be another dialogue between Alex Kremli and Dr. Shabir Ali on the topic, Who is the True God? Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night.